All right, we are going to try something new. Okay, so be sure to follow me over at my Twitter handle. That's Eric D. July. You can also visit my website, ericdjuly.com for more information. You can listen to my podcast over there, which is called For Canon's Sake. But I have a new approach to movie reviews that I want to try. The whole reason many of you guys are subscribers here is because of my knowledge on the source material of mainstream comics, be it Marvel or DC. Having read so many comics over the years, understand that it is through that lens that I view a comic book related movie or TV show. And I should, if they are going to go out of their way to actually make movies or live action versions of these characters. So moving forward for comic book movie reviews, I'm going to give you a history of the characters and their arcs that are really involved instead of just giving you a flat review. Then we'll analyze the plot and then I'll actually give you my review. These will not be spoiler free, but this will in turn make these videos very, very long. And that's the whole entire point. I want to try to equip you with the knowledge base. So you have at least that baseline so you can really understand that lens through which I'm looking for when I personally view the movie. As I always say, sometimes having that knowledge on those characters can be both a gift and a curse. It can hinder or raise your potential enjoyment for the film, but that's what it's all about, that unique perspective. So consider this the first official ripified long form review and breakdown of a movie. Grab some popcorn, kick back and put me on your big screen. Tell your husband or your wife to shut up and pay attention. Or if you have, let's say a long trip or something like that, just play the audio because it'll be just as good. Let's first take some time and go through the history of the birds of prey. The Birds of Prey as a group in the comics popped off in the 1990s, and it had absolutely nothing to do with Harley Quinn. The two OGs were Oracle, formerly Bad Girl, before she was, of course, shot by the Joker, which paralyzed her from the waist down, essentially, and Black Canary. Oracle contacts Black Canary for help with a mission considering her expertise in crime fighting. The subject of the story has a thing for ladies like her, and Oracle also felt sorry for Black Canary because she was in this tough spot, especially financially. Black Canary also gets this new suit from Oracle. Uh, she ditched the wig, the blonde wig, and instead dyed her own hair blonde. This is not the original Black Canary from the 40s in Dinah Drake. This is the daughter, Dinah Lance. Now, Lynx was also in this book as the main adversary, or more so one of the main adversaries at the time. But this story is just centered around Black Canary and Oracle taking down a bit of this eco-terrorist and businessman by the name of Nick Devine. This comic was a one shot. Around the same time, we got other books such as Birds of a Feather with Lois Lane and of course the Birds of Prey and then Birds of Prey Manhunt, which was a four issue limited series. So in the beginning, it was mainly just a team with Black Canary and with Barbara on the comms. But starting on issue one of Birds of Prey Manhunt, Huntress joins after running into Black Canary when they both were chasing a man by the name of Archer Braun. This again is in the 90s, so it's post-crisis on infinite earths, meaning that this is not the first Huntress like this wasn't the first uh, Black Canary um, that you may know of in terms of Huntress. You may have been introduced to Helena Wayne, which is Batman and Catwoman's daughter. This is the second version of Huntress, which is Helena Bertinelli. This is actually ironic because Selena Kyle also teamed up with them during this run. Long story short, they all crossed paths because of this Arthur Braun guy. And the Oracle didn't want Black Canary to stick with them due to their mutual adversary. All three of them did end up working together, though they weren't an official team, despite what the book title is. I guess there's a couple of things worth noting. One of the main things, because this is Hunter's first time teaming up with them, is the personality types. We can mention that as well. Oracle is on the comms and more by the books. Canary kind of goes rogue sometimes and that gets her in trouble. You'll see this sort of theme uh, going into the future as well. She also is similar to Catwoman in a sense of utilizing her sex appeal to really catch people off guard, even taking advantage of them. Huntress, on the other hand, doesn't really utilize that. All of these make for an interesting clash 
as expected early on the other three are just arguing with catwoman so it seems more like huntress would be a good fit for this team as opposed to catwoman and they work together in this particular book or this series uh, to, uh, they work together reluctantly this makes sense considering that catwoman's motive is just for this money and she's only part of this clique because she lost money again this isn't really a team up up to this point aside from canary none of these have ever had superpowers as well i guess we can mention that aside from canary who doesn't actually use her canary cry initially but the mid 90s clearly established that the birds of prey were more of a duo between black canary and oracle so if there are to be ogs in this crew the birds of prey it'd be both of them there were several other one shots that were released such as like birds of prey revolution and birds of prey wolves both of these consist of very forgettable villains and this can be said for birds of prey batgirl and birds of prey the ravens so if you were reading just the birds of prey little one shots alone uh during that time you wouldn't really know much about the characters you'd have to read other books uh they were mostly just one shots birds of prey ravens does introduce this team called the ravens which is an all-female gang consisting of cheshire pistolera uh termina and vicious but dc clearly wanted to establish that this duo is a legitimate team and friendship there is no birds of prey without black canary and oracle so you can imagine how odd it can be for a fan to see birds of prey play out with Harley Quinn fronting this film, considering that she was never even in the picture early on. It wasn't until 1999 when the Birds of Prey first got their real ongoing series, the first real ongoing series. And this series spanned over the course of like 127 issues and it went 10 years strong. The team just consisted of Black Canary and Oracle and the first big villain was Hellhound who was introduced just a few years prior the first real arc consisted of yet again black canary on a mission and ending up getting kidnapped and working as a slave on this island of relasia this island was actually the subject in the very first birds of prey comic that i mentioned early so it was cool that they came back to that now by issue three robin actually shows up and he's assisting oracle in getting black canary back to safety this arc predictably ends with a final showdown between Black Canary and Hellhound. Now, for the guys that are Batman folks and you see Barbara Gordon and you're like, where's Batman? He doesn't really show up in the first initial books, the Birds of Prey books. Not really. They act as if they are their own team. And it's good that they did do that. The only time Batman really shows up is in that that series, that short limited series where the Batmobile, you can see with batman and robin just driving through and you can see that huntress is trying to avoid them but that's really it aside from that though some of these characters may have historically been connected aside from black canary but certainly with barbara gordon you see her connected to batman and the likes as well as huntress when i mentioned her not really the case for the birds of prey he only shows up batman only shows up just in that limited series and he was only there for like a panel or two I'd argue that the coolest thing that happened in the earlier issues of this series is Superman coming to save Black Canary when she was about to get killed by a Guy Gardner clone. A Guy Gardner is or was a Green Lantern. This clone, though, is an alien superpowered version of him, and he was easily handled by Superman. After that, we have a series of team ups with the likes of Catwoman, uh, Power Girl, and some more forgettable villains. It wasn't until issue 15 of this run where we had a more notable villain pop up, and that's the Joker when he appears, but it's not for long. Uh, really, just the arc deals with Oracle stopping a bomb from killing millions, and Joker ends up going to the slab. I'm getting the feeling that you're getting what I'm saying and covering the first Birds of Prey series up until now, and I want to keep it in context of the movie, so I'm gonna try to speed up through this. For much of this 10 year series, the Birds of Prey is just Oracle and Black Canary going on missions and sometimes working with other characters, including the Bat Family folks, such as Nightwing, Robin, and uh, most of the villains are really forgettable, but they do end up dealing with some more notable ones such as Gorilla Grodd and Deathstroke. Things don't really get interesting in the Birds of Prey, at least in my honest opinion, until issue 27 of this series. 
more bat family members appear now just because james gordon oracle's father was shot and is in the hospital the only lead that they have on who did it is the ever elusive cat woman so they seek to find her now this is also when we get the cassandra kane appearance as she's actually filled the role of bad girl now so we are talking about the entire bat family at the time they're a part of this arc you got batman cassandra kane Azrael, Robin, Nightwing, though this is a Birds of Prey book, Black Canary does not appear in issue 27. But when trying to track down who they thought was Catwoman, they run into no one other than Harley Quinn. So the first time Harley Quinn appears in a Birds of Prey book is issue 27 of their ongoing series, the first ongoing series. She does nothing but appear to let them know where Catwoman is, only to be kicked in the face by Cassandra Kane. I guess since this is her first big appearance in the book, I can tell you more about Kane. She's a highly trained assassin. I'm talking about from when she was a baby on to the age that she is at the time of this issue. She's the daughter of Lady Shiva, who appeared in a Birds of Prey book earlier. Now, she doesn't talk much and can't really read or write she's just a trained assassin and she's trained to kick ass which makes for this great dynamic with the bat family because sometimes they have to try to reel her in in current comics she's orphaned and post rebirth era of detective comics to me she's been one of my favorite characters in the bat family and even batman has admitted that she has a competitive advantage over even him if they had to get into a real fight. So that sort of lets you know just how skilled this girl is. Black Canary doesn't really return until the next issue as the story of who shot Gordon continues in Catwoman and there's another link up in between that time with the Ravens. The next set of notable villains are going to be the Al Ghul family when Black Canary becomes this bit of a love interest to Raz Al Ghul. Keep in mind, Cassandra Kane was actually trained in a sense to be a bodyguard of Roz. So there's that connection. But Black Canary doesn't know that he's Roz Al Ghul. She thinks his name is Raymond De Sumer. This actually causes a rift between Oracle and Black Canary because Oracle is under that suspicion that he is Roz Al Ghul and had Jason Bard spying on her due to that suspicion. Now, Roz plans to try to have a son through Black Canary, and this angers his daughter because she thinks that she wants the son to replace her, Talia Al Ghul, that is. So, she's all upset. They have a little argument and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, because Canary states that she can't have kids anyway, Roz wants to prepare the Lazarus Pit for her so that again she can. This is how Black Canary learns that Oracle was right and she gets held sort of hostage. Oracle is able to locate Black Canary, deploy Honey, Militia, Power Girl, and Blue Beetle, along with herself, to go save her. But she does end up getting to the Lazarus Pit. And this is when Black Canary finally gets her powers back and she can use her Canary Cry. Keep in mind, she has not used this power because she hasn't had it for basically this entire run of Birds of Prey and even before. By issue 40, Spoiler makes an appearance in the Birds of Prey comic books. Now, Spoiler, aka Stephanie Brown, has and still does team up a lot with Robin. That's Tim Drake. And in the current era of comics, she's his love interest. She's been Batgirl before, as well as uh, she's the daughter of Clue Master. Similar thing as some of the other members of the Bat family. They are heroes, but their parents of some sort were villains. I mentioned Stephanie because she'll be reappearing over the years. You'll also notice that the pace starts to change around this time throughout this series. And that's mainly, or at least in my opinion, it stems from the fact that Black Canary has her cry back. So the stakes are a little higher or it allows them to be a little higher. Nonetheless, everything else is still the same with the duo with occasional team ups mostly with power girl power girl probably teams up with the birds of prey more than any other character during the first half of this run but after the debut of the villain savan creote in issue 57 huntress finally reappears in the birds of prey from what i can remember this is the first time that she's appeared in a book since really that initial limited series so it'd been about maybe five years real time 
Now, her introduction is Oracle contacting her and needing help to save Canary yet again. She's under duress. The only thing relevant about the two villains in Savannah Creole is that their relationship is much like the two villains in the Birds of Prey movie. And we'll get into that later. It almost seems as if they just swapped the names in terms of how they like interact with one another. Also in this team up, they acknowledge the outfit change of Huntress, who now shows off her like stomach a little more. She attributes this to doing 700 sit-ups a day. But during this arc, Black Canary got severely injured. Uh, she gets sidelined, which basically gets her fired by Black Canary. And this is when we see Huntress is now running these missions with Oracle on the comm. So if there is a legitimate Huntress addition to the Birds of Prey as a team up, at least momentarily, it'd probably be around issue 60 or you can point to that. Huntress formally, though, joins the team in issue 67, so it wasn't until the mid-2000s when the duo becomes an actual trio. I respect this because Huntress was one of the first characters to ever team up with Oracle and Black Canary. But Vixen's first appearance soon follows as she appears in issue 69 in a conflict with Huntress. Vixen is the holder of the Tantu Totem, which gives her these Animal Kingdom-like powers. At the time, she had been under this mind control, which eventually she breaks out of, of course, and she's teaming up with Huntress. For those that have seen the movie, and you're looking at the character on this cover that I'm showing you, you'll see that she looks like another character in the new Birds of Prey movie that isn't Vixen. But she's teaming up with Huntress for multiple reasons and uh, multiple issues more so. During this time, Oracle is attacked by Brainiac through her computer and this is causing her to go through it mentally so much so that she's attacking black canary basically what's going on is that brainiac is trying to get control of her but she does end up sort of fighting him off black mask who is the center of attention in the entire new birds of prey movie shows up in issue 75 it's really in just a flashback to really paint what led to the moment that they're in with this tower blowing up but they refer to Batman issue number 33. So if there's to be any historical reference for the sake of this video and for the sake of this movie, Black Mask first technically appears in the Birds of Prey book in issue 75. Perhaps one of the more highly emphasized things out of this entire series is issue 76, which is the first official debut of the character Black Alice, a powerful chick with these magical like uh, Powers, who is a student at a school that at the time Huntress was undercover in. Now, in this short period of time, another character by the name of Lady Blackhawk ends up teaming up with the others um, in the Birds of Prey. To be honest, her introduction was a little randomized, but she ends up sliding right in. And this character, Zenda Blake, that's her name, has been around forever. She actually favors and looks to Black Canary a lot. There's not really um too much to the character that i guess i can mention that's worth mentioning uh, just understand that she is a former pilot and she has no superpowers meanwhile oracle is still dealing with the effects of that you know that attack um she has this now techno virus and according to dr midnight if they remove it oracle would lose movement or could lose movement she risks losing movement from her neck on down and remember she's already paralyzed from the waist down Next up is a very important thing to the character growth of Oracle. Alongside Cyborg and accompanied by Superman, Dr. Midnight prepares for the operation to get rid of this tumor-like device which has been the source of her issue. It is a successful operation, but the coolest thing out of all of this is that she could move her toes after the operation. However, she still will be in a wheelchair for most of the following issues. The next issue, issue 86, is when Lady Blackhawk dubs the team as the Birds of Prey. She drew her influence from the fact that you had a Canary, you had Blackhawk, you had a Huntress, and so forth. The Oracle thing was a little bit randomized. So keep in mind that the name of the books were called Birds of Prey. But they were never actually called the Birds of Prey as a team up until now. And the one that coined the term isn't even one of the OGs of the group. Starting in issue 92, Lady Shiva, a person that has been a villain multiple times to the Birds of Prey, joins them briefly and she calls herself the Jade Canary. Now remember, this is the mom of Cassandra Kane. 
Then by issue 93, Gypsy joins the crew as well. Now, Gypsy is an illusionist, so you can see how she could be pretty useful to the team. And for the next issues, they spend a lot of time fighting with the society and a villain known as Prometheus. Another big debut during the Birds of Prey run was in issue 96, which marked the debut of another character calling herself Batgirl. There's been a lot of those. Her name is Charlotte Gage Radcliffe. Unlike the other bad girls, though, she's a metahuman. And at the time, she's being chased around by the birds of prey, and they're trying to really find out who she is. But she never actually joins the birds of prey uh, on a team up or anything like that. It also is worth noting that in issue 100, 100 that is, birds of prey introduced the character Judo Master, and she teams up with the birds of prey for a little bit along with Big Barda of the New God. So you can see this trend of newer female characters throughout DC being introduced through the Birds of Prey uh, ongoing series. The Secret Six ends up being the next big group of villains to combat the Birds of Prey. This starts in issue 104 and this leads to the Birds of Prey teaming up with Hawkgirl and even Manhunter for a little bit. Now Harley Quinn is actually part of the Secret Six crew, so at the time she's an enemy of the Birds of Prey. The reason why I'm speeding through a lot of these characters is because they are never really on that team for long. It's more of just a team of maybe three, four, maybe even five issues. But really the main Birds of Prey core that isn't in and out will be Huntress, Lady Blackhawk, uh, Oracle, and of course Black Canary. The rest are just some female characters throughout DC's history that end up leaving when it's all said and done. It's like that revolving door. By around issue 117, this list of team ups adds Charlotte, the girl or the bat girl that I mentioned before, now being referred to as Misfit. And this is the name that she carries going into the future. This ongoing series is coming to a close and the last big villain of the Birds of Prey are going to be the Joker and then the Silicon Syndicate. The last official Birds of Prey team, which ends on issue 127, consists of Black Canary Lady Blackhawk, Huntress, Oracle, Manhunter, and Misfit. A character by the name of Infinity is also around, but she's not important at all. But what is important? What would I, I guess, have you learn upon wrapping up the first ongoing series of The Birds of Prey, which expands roughly 10 years? Just know that the first half of this run, The Birds of Prey, is a duo of Black Canary and Oracle, just like it started out. They are the foundational members. There is no Birds of Prey without those two. It then adds Huntress, which was one of the first characters they ever teamed up with, and then Lady Blackhawk. Everybody else, really, I wouldn't even consider official Birds of Prey members as they are only there momentarily, revolving uh, door. But you can tell the whole point of this comic, or one of the major points, was to really establish and introduce female characters and they did a decent job this was actually the book that got me into hunters for example even though they didn't introduce hunters through this book but what's next for the birds of prey considering that the new 52 era is right around the corner but not just yet there was one more volume volume two of the birds of prey that picks up the following year right before the new 52 the team starts off consisting of the main four members that I mentioned recently. The first issue just deals with them getting back together, the team getting back together. But more importantly, it introduces the White Canary as the team's first enemy. You're probably like, White Canary? Sarah Lance? Black Canary's sister? Nope. For those that watch the Arrowverse, there is no such thing as a Sarah Lance. You could actually consider the White Canary in the Arrowverse whitewashed in the Arrowverse as the first white canary is Chinese. The cool thing is how easily she's able to kick the behinds of both Huntress and Black Canary considering how skilled both of them are. This tells you just how good of a fighter White Canary is. A big turning point is how the White Canary set up the Birds of Prey crew who are teaming up with characters by the name of Dove and Hawk. This forced the hand of the birds of prey and they duked it out with the cops and this puts them on the run this introduces a entirely new dynamic for the team as now they're labeled as domestic terrorists by the public so you can sort of guess that this changes like everything in terms of how they're able to operate 
Penguin is also in the middle of all this, which is kind of goofy, not really important. But at the end of this issue, White Canary threatened them all by saying that she was going to kill someone every like six hours or so and they can choose or she could choose. The first dead really appears to be Savant, right? which then caused Creo to kill himself in response. Remember, these two started out as villains. But on the last run, they sort of turned into more like anti-heroes and even helped the Birds of Prey from time to time. So while they weren't members of the Birds of Prey, they were allies. But the death seemed to be fake as they both then appear to sneak up on Oracle, appearing to be villains yet again. Basically, Savant has these like psychological issues and he can't really conceptualize like the concept of time like the passage of it more so so back when he was doing the anti-hero thing he was getting tortured by a villain i can't remember who it was and the villain wanted him to specifically give up oracle so he's living that torture over and over and over again as if it just happened now uh savant just really wants to kill himself in front of barbara so she knows why he did it like you're the reason this is i'm about to do this now this doesn't happen though because barbara does end up grabbing him and stopping him from falling off or jumping off the ledge creole also helps him back up and there's this sort of odd scene where savant's mad at creole because he's like you're my friend you were supposed to let me do this. this is what i wanted and barbara's like you idiot he loves you this is why he 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 did that this goes back to sort of what i was talking about with the two villains in the birds of prey movie which we'll cover here in a little bit savant and, and creole's sort of um friendship if you will mimics that more than anything but nonetheless more details about the white canary are revealed we learned that she's the sister of the 12 brothers in silk and they were adversaries of the birds of prey in the previous volume this dishonored their father's legacy so the sister the white canary was the one that actually killed them all all of this is stated in dialogue among this sort of really really epic fight it's some really good artwork here that really captures this but black canary seems to win but she finds out at the end of that issue i believe it's issue four if i'm not mistaken that it wasn't white canary that set that whole team up and you know again they've been on the run for a little bit here it was actually lady shiva and white canary says if you let me free we'll go kill a uh, kill her both together so in order for the black canary to go on this little rogue event she leaves the team and heads to thailand with white canary but she's trailed by both lady black hawk and hunters this is centered around a kid by the name of sin that appeared in the previous volume of birds of prey but black canary tells huntress that the white canary has you know this kid sin again uh and her foster parents and she'll kill them if she didn't cooperate and white canary she's demanding that black canary challenges lady shiva to a duel a formal duel but before said formal duel hunter says that she's going to be the one to take the fight uh because black canary she has a broken wrist she broke her wrist in the fight with white canary of the previous fight uh but huntress she prepares herself before this battle and this gives me a little bit of time to bring up something that's very essential to this character and that's her faith for those that are familiar with Marvel's Daredevil, I'd argue that it's just as important to her as it is to him if we do a compare and contrast. You can see this in this panel where she kisses the cross and she always wears this around her neck if you've been paying attention to some of the uh, pictures that I've been showing here. And she's also seen with cross earrings a lot of the times, but I want you to really keep this in mind because I'm going to bring this back up not only later in some uh, previous or not previous future issues, but also I'm going to bring it up when we talk about the movie. So they begin to duke it out. And this is important because Huntress is losing this fight. And you can really just see how skilled Lady Shiva is, even if you compare her fighting ability to the Black Canary, because in previous issues, certainly in the previous volumes, Shiva and like Black Canary would go at it and they'd be like neck and neck for the most part but here we see huntress is or it seems that she's severely outmatched but meanwhile terry who is a girl that works for the white canary defects and really tells black canary that she knows where sand is and they find her and the tide also turns in the fight 
with Huntress or between Huntress and Lady Shiva when Huntress uses the blood from her mouth because again she's been getting beat up this whole entire time and she throws it in the eyes of Shiva and that sort of gives her the upper hand so she had to use that as a tactic to sort of win this fight because it seems if she fought her straight up there was no way that she was going to win but Black Canary steps in and says they no longer have to do this because they again found the kid and White Canary just leaves really because she has the upper hand or they have the upper hand the birds of prey and this is interesting because really this is the last time to my knowledge that we ever even see white canary they didn't go revisit this and maybe they will in the future but it's been almost 10 years since we've even last seen this character from what i can remember Things start to move ridiculously fast and you can tell that there was something being done behind the scenes with DC and it just comes to this abrupt stop, a quick pace change out of nowhere and it doesn't really have an ending that you'd expect from an ongoing series, any ongoing series. But it ended at the end of 2011 with the same core four being really a part of the team. So this volume is the last time that you see both Misfit and some of the other characters that had potential, such as White Canary, like I mentioned earlier, as well as there was this new character by the name of Mortis, which was a villain. I thought she could have been expanded upon, but this series only made it up to 15 issues. But it led to the new 52 era of DC, which you've heard me mention on this channel before. I've said that this was one of the worst mistakes that DC has ever made. Cannon went out the window as this follows flashpoint in which barry allen's story really or that story was centered around barry allen and it changed the entire universe the main universe i covered the story on this channel so you can go check out that video just know that the main universe now is completely changed like 10 years of history have been removed from all of its characters uh, though rebirth era in 2016 seemed to patch a lot of those mistakes we still to this day are trying to patch up and figure out like what matters, what's canon prior to uh, 2011. So let's at least talk about what happened to the Birds of Prey during the New 52 era and how some things changed. There were a bunch of retcons. It sucks because you have to look at these characters as if they are new characters after 2011. And then you have to look as if they are a mix of that new character and the old one, pre-2011, after 2016, that rebirth era. If you really want to know of those events, read Flashpoint, uh, Convergence, then Rebirth, and then Doomsday Clock, which recently ended. But anyway, The New Birds of Prey is the first book in which this new version of Dinah Lance shows up. She says that she's forming this new team for whatever reason and wants this new character by the name of Starling to be a part of it. She's just a, just a woman with a tattoo on her arm we don't know much about her yes it's as stupid as it sounds imagine going from reading all of those birds of prey comics to reading a new one where black canary wants to build a team with a character you've never heard of no oracle no anything no huntress but by the end of the first issue katana is brought up and then she is recruited to be in the on the team and then the next issue you got poison ivy of all people so yes it, it's pretty stupid it isn't until issue four when barbara gordon reappears and in this new timeline she's no longer in a wheelchair she's batgirl again and i guess that's a positive but still this is a crime five issues in there's nothing really important going on it's just a gathering of this team that isn't remotely like his previous self so you have five members and they fight basically nobody important for the first nine issues those five members Black Canary, Starling, Katana, Poison Ivy, and Bad Girl. By issue 11, Poison Ivy defects, and that makes sense because she was the most odd part of the team. So then there were four. To add insult to injury, they released issue zero of The Birds of Prey, like 12 issues in, and they tried to set the scene for Black Canary, Starling, and Bad Girl. But this makes it worse as it's only a year prior to the current timeline and this is where Batgirl and Black Canary first meet. But eventually Katana ends up quitting the team and two characters, additional characters, end up joining the team. One by the name of Strix, 
and the other by the name of Condor, two very forgettable characters. But Condor is the first male addition to the Birds of Prey that I can really think of, albeit a stupid one and a stupid addition. Starling at some point betrays the team, which you could kind of see coming uh, in issue zero. Um, but during all of this, keep in mind that these characters do appear in other books. Batgirl, for example, has her own ongoing series. Oh, and I forgot to mention, history is told of Dinah Lance being married to a guy by the name of Kurt who was killed. That's why her name is Dinah Lance, not Dinah Drake. <sighs> but uh, Lance was brought back to life. Yes, it, it, look, this is all bad. The only thing, I guess, worth a dang out of this series is issue 25, which tells of her origin story, although not a very good one, this new Black Canary. It, it just tells the story of an orphaned Black Canary being trained by some random dude by the name of Desmond Lamar, generic Black uh, martial artist who raised her and trained her and then died of brain cancer. By the end of that issue, with her dojo burned to the ground, she had a dojo, um, and she's frustrated. She ends up joining this militaristic team. And I guess that's supposed to give you this idea or make you think that she has had even more training in addition to the training that she got from Desmond Lamar. Look, this is all bad. They do end up coming into contact with some historic villains such as Ra's al Ghul and the Suicide Squad as well. Harley Quinn was part of that crew, but they're they're all forgettable stories. And we in this volume, by far, the most terrible one of all time when it comes to the Birds of Prey, at issue 34 with the team breaking up. The final four were Condor, Strix, two very forgettable characters, Black Canary, and Batgirl. Look, the new 52 was a mistake, a massive mistake, not just for the Birds of Prey, but for DC in general, specifically for those of us that grew up reading these books grew up loving these characters only for us to enter into a new era of needless retcons and ridiculous changes to backstories changes that nobody asked for not just to the team like in this regards when it comes to the birds of prey but characters in general i've talked about black canary and her retcon huntress isn't even in this version of the birds of prey she doesn't even appear until three years into the new 52 and not in a birds of prey book in nightwing and perhaps the most criminal thing about her was the retcon and it was retcon out of existence and that's her cling to and the importance of her catholic faith with that being said thank god for the rebirth era of dc comics batgirl and the birds of prey rebirth finally gets this team back on track Batgirl and the Birds of Prey Rebirth drops alongside a bunch of other Rebirth titles regarding the other characters um, in DC Comics. I will say the artwork is not good. In fact, I'd say that it's pretty terrible, but the story is solid. It starts with us revisiting Joker shooting Barbara Gordon. And of course, after she was shot, she was paralyzed, launching her Oracle days and then starting the Birds of Prey with Black Canary. This made me so happy to read because it was a clear effort by way of DC to say, look, we messed up. But Barbara links up with Black Canary to team up just like old times on this mission. So think of it like this. The old continuity is somewhat being acknowledged, but Barbara is no longer Oracle as she's now Batgirl. So she's actually hitting the streets on the mission, which is not something like we've seen before again prior to 2011 and going into the new 52. We also get a Huntress sighting where she is in the church, so this revisits her Catholic faith. Keep in mind, this is the first rebirth issue. This was a clear effort by DC to just make sure that they got back to the roots. Now, Huntress, though, there's a slight attitude change. She is a little more cutthroat. We're actually starting the story with her being on the hunt. The first official issue of Batgirl and the Birds of Prey begins with a quick flashback of Oracle and the Black Canary days. Then it continues from the story that was just told in the Rebirth comic where Black Canary and Batgirl, they end up running into Huntress, who has this list of mob folk that she's like killing off. They were chasing the same person. And they were confused as to why Huntress knows their real names. Now, for the record, Huntress is hunting down 
people that were part of the killing of like her entire family. And it's confirmed that that was almost 20 years prior to the current date. There's a new Oracle also running around. They think that she's connected to that and, and all of that. And they're all caught up in it. And this is why they really agreed to work with each other. So the important thing to pick up out of all of this is that the timeline is now back to being similar to the old one before the new 52. And what I mean by that is that Barbara and Dinah were the OGs and they went on plenty of missions together before and then Huntress joins um, and they become a trio after that. This is just a more modernized version of it and they have things like Black Canary being a singer or former singer in a band. Throughout this series, you get flashbacks of the character so it puts it into perspective what is actually canon now and what is not. As an example, Huntress in a flashback tells the story of her family being killed. In this version, uh, the Casamentos family killed her family, which were part of this sort of rival gang. And then her father's allies moved her to Italy, where she then trained. To compare and contrast, in the old version, a similar thing happened, but the Casamento family didn't kill her family. Santo Casamento just happened to be her biological father as her mother had an affair with the rival gang member. A guy by the name of Stefano Mondragora was the person that actually ordered the hit on her family in the old version. Again, that's pre-2011. And this version is just as sad of a story, though. Frank Bertinelli is her actual father, but Maria Bertinelli, her mother, she worked with Santo to kill her father. The plan just backfired because Santo's men was trying to kill the entire family except the mother of course, and they actually thought they killed Helena, that is Huntress, and she was supposed to die. She just played possum. Um, so again, Santo just took this opportunity to try to kill off the entire family while saving the mother Maria. So both thought that the other were dead, right? And in issue six, they all reunite Santo, Helena, and her mother. And with the opportunity to kill Santo, she doesn't. Huntress instead allows Jim Gordon to arrest both Santo and her own mother for the killing of her entire family. There's also a new oracle that pops up. He was inspired by Barbara. His name is Gus Yell, but he ends up getting killed off near the end of the run, as well as Maria, Huntress's mother. What I can't say about the characters I've already said, so I'm not going to bore you to death with the details of this run. It just ended not too long ago in 2018. The important thing I want you to take from this is that this run got the birds of prey back to being the birds of prey as Rebirth allowed them to do so. The main difference is that Batgirl is not in a wheelchair like she was in the old days and she's actually part of the new missions because she's Batgirl, not Oracle. Another thing is that there's no Lady Blackhawk. She exists, but she's not appeared post New 52 era with the birds of prey. I do... I really do hope that if there is to be a new Birds of Prey series, they bring her back. Uh, but let's segue into the movie. And I'm going to give you my review, but there's some details that we need to work out. The movie Birds of Prey, though called the Birds of Prey, has a bunch of characters in it that have historically had nothing to do with the Birds of Prey. I guess if you say, and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, you can get away with that. But let's go through those before I give my review. Let's start with the obvious, Harley Quinn. She's appeared in a few books, but she's never been in The Birds of Prey. She's a former doctor who goes nuts when, you know, she falls in love with the Joker. Believe it or not, she's not an original comic book character. She appeared in Batman the Animated Series before she ever appeared in a comic. But in the comics, she usually just, she's seen sort of with Joker or tied to Joker somehow and some other like villainous teams. Though she she has been like presented as a more anti-hero and even a flat out hero sometimes that really didn't start until again <laughs> after the new 52. Me personally, I think this change was needless. I'm not saying that she had to be under Joker all the time, but the forced anti-hero thing is a bit lousy. She's much better as just a straight villain. Renee Montoya is also in the movie, having never been tied to the Birds of Prey. She may have appeared like in one comic and that was really in the recent series. I don't remember at all anything before that. She's also another character that appeared in Batman, the animated series before the comics. 
She's a lesbian cop that works for the GCPD. Again, it's the Gotham City Police Department. In the comics, she's been a bit of a love interest before of Batwoman. Now, she does end up becoming the question. Like, yeah, she's a female version of the, the question at some point. And that's when you can actually make the argument that she has more connection to the Birds of Prey because she's worked with, as the question, she was working with some of those members. But again, even as the question, she was never in the Birds of Prey. There's actually more of a connection to Victor Zoss from a historical point because she first appeared really in that whole Nightfall arc right and that was when she had come into conflict with victor's ass so there's more of a historical connection to him who's in the movie um, than there is to really the birds of prey at least as far as i can see it so let's talk about victor's ass he's the same old crazy deranged serial killer the thing that makes him like notable is the fact that he puts like tally marks on him he cuts tally marks on himself every time he kills someone he actually debuted in the Shadow of the Bat series alongside Black Mask. The only thing is that the Black Mask in the movie is not the same Black Mask that appear with Victor's ass. The movie version is the original Roman Sionis version of Black Mask. Now, the Black Mask that he appears with in the comics is the head of Arkham Asylum at the time, Jeremiah Arkham. If you watch the movie, you wouldn't think that, though. You think they, they're like really, really connected. From what I remember, or what I can remember, and I could be wrong on this. I'm willing to be wrong on this. There's no real connection between the Sionis version of Black Mask and Zass. At least not to the degree that they are depicted like in the movie. In the current run of Harley Quinn, though, he does appear to rival her. But that, again, is a very recent thing. Which brings me to Black Mask, the main villain in the movie. He's been around forever, mainly as a Batman villain. He has like rivaled Harley before they've gone at it, but usually it's in a team setting, not just like her directly. Just know that he's a guy who walks around in a black mask and uh, he was once killed by Catwoman. Of course, the mask um, is like the most notable part of him. But historically speaking, it has been just a mask. Well, before the new 52, which kind of changed that lore. And now it's it can control minds and all kinds of things. This character has never actually beefed with the Birds of Prey. The only time uh, Black Mask appears are in those flashbacks that I mentioned earlier with uh, Batgirl. Moving on, Cassandra Kane. She's one of my favorite characters in the more recent Bat family, and she's also in the Birds of Prey movie. I mentioned her when she appeared in the Birds of Prey comic as Batgirl, but I didn't speak much about her. She's going by a couple of other different names, such as Black Cat, but she's a trained assassin. And she's been trained that way since she was born. Like she was born and, and, and just bred to be a bodyguard <laughs> of Ra's al Ghul, uh, League of Assassins. So she, she just knows what she's doing. She's one of the greatest like martial arts or the best martial arts fighters in DC's universe. She doesn't talk much. And right now she goes by the hero name of Orphan. Now on the channel, I have talked about how post-rebirth Bat Family, so that was more so centered around Detective Comics, is one of the most intriguing Bat Families ever. There was Spoiler, Orphan, uh, Red Robin, Batwoman, Clayface, Batwing. It made for an interesting dynamic. I have a lot to say about this character later when we do the review, but for now, I'll say this. She's the best fighter of everybody that i've mentioned when it comes to hand to hand combat you can make that argument fairly easily i also say this about cassandra kane and the others aside from huntress and black canary all the other characters have very loose connections in the comic books the closest connection with the most members present is when cassandra kane kicked harley in the face in the birds of prey comic when they were looking for catwoman you can make the argument that Cassandra Cain and Huntress have that connection because they're both part of the Bat family, and that would be a good argument. But Cain has never actually been in the Birds of Prey. Neither has Harley or uh, Renee Montoya. The other connections are very loose where there are alliances here and there. There's rivalries here and there, uh, but they're very short and the connections don't really run deep. So now you know everything you need to know about the history of the Birds of Prey and the individuals that are in the movie. So let's get into the actual movie review. 
Of course, I may have missed some things and I'm sure there's gonna be some tryhards in the comments that'll let me know what I failed to mention or what needs a slight correction. But now you know at least the history of the Birds of Prey as a team and you have a better understanding of some of those characters. So let's talk about the plot in the Birds of Prey movie. This movie is centered around Harley Quinn and really it's just her movie as she narrates the entire thing as if the story is being told through her. This just takes place after the Suicide Squad movie and deals with Harley Quinn moving on from just being like under the Joker, right? Because she was known around as being Joker's little plaything. It granted her this certain privilege and often she could do whatever she wanted because people were afraid of Joker. This is why she takes her time before telling everybody. Now in a symbol, she destroys Ace Chemicals, which is the place where Harley Quinn becomes Harley Quinn and decides to really dedicate her life to Joker. This comes with its set of issues because the word gets out and now the people that she's kind of screwed over once are dead. Meanwhile, Roman Sionis, AKA Black Mask, is a gang leader and a nightclub owner and the second in charge seems to be Victor Zass, who Black Mask sort of orders around. The two have an odd relationship as you really think they were gay, but it's never actually said. They don't do anything like kiss, but you know, you can kind of feel that tension. Sionis' club is where we get our first glance at Dinah Lance, AKA Black Canary. She sings at the club, thus working for Black Mask. Harley Quinn gets drunk at Sionis' club and out back there's a guy basically trying to take advantage of her. Black Canary pops up and beats up the dude, so this is Dinah and Harley's like first real connection aside from the one they briefly had right before that scene uh, in the club before. Now, Sionis saw how good of a fighter Black Canary he was like watching uh, from above and now he wants her to be his driver. So this is Dinah and Harley's first real connection aside from the one they briefly had in the club shortly before. Um, Sionis, however, was looking like down, he was above in, in his building and he saw how good of a fighter that Black Canary was and now he wants to give her promotion as being his driver. And the former driver is no longer in the equation because Harley Quinn broke his legs. There's also a crossbow hunter going around killing mob members and Detective Renee Montoya is investigating it. The former driver of Sionis fed her information, so this is how she first links up with Dinah Lance, because she's like, yeah, um, you know, he used to do this or what have you. There's some dialogue in which she acknowledges that her mother was a black canary before she was killed. Again, that's a conversation between Black Canary and Renee Montoya. On the other hand though, Montoya's connection to Harley happens to be at the beginning of the movie when Harley's necklace is found at Ace Chemicals and, or that chemical site, you know, after she blew it up, she threw her necklace off. So that's how they knew it was her. So there's a diamond that has the account numbers of this Bertinelli family, that subject really for this entire movie. It's the center of everything. Everybody wants this diamond, right? Sionis of course wants it and he's having Zass and Dinah go fetch it. The person who has the diamond though is just like, kid pick she's a pickpocket and she goes by the name of cassandra kane that's her name she's a child um well she's a child she's living in a foster home she has come into contact with dinah lance because she lives in the same building as her now cassandra kane was caught stealing a bunch of things so she ends up getting caught and heading to the gcpd but she swallowed the diamond so they couldn't find it so the diamond everybody's looking for is in cassandra kane's stomach Harley was caught by Sionis' men and right before he is about to have her killed by Zash, she says that she can help him find the diamond. So he allows her to live if she can go fetch it. This is when we see the scene of her walking in the GCPD and beating up all those cops, shooting those non-lethal uh, grenades out of the launcher. This is because Kane is in custody at the GCPD and Zass also, not Zass, more so Black mask put out that bounty for the kid so now you have these gangsters trying to get the kid as well so of course that creates the conflict between harley and the other gangsters there's a scene where harley literally is high on this confiscated cocaine and she wrecks all of them so harley now has kane and she's trying to get the kid to crap out this diamond so they've been kicking it building this bond and whatnot right meanwhile the crossbow hunter or the crossbow killer is revealed to be the huntress and she, again, is just going around killing a bunch of people. As far as Harley and Cassandra Kane, they're setting up shop upstairs, or that's where her apartment is, like the upstairs of this restaurant. 
and she she's cool with this uh, owner. It's like an Asian restaurant, right? At least she thought she was cool with him, but he does end up selling her out. And her room was attacked, of course, by these men. The betrayal also influences Harley to sell out the kid to Sionis. And she says that she'll meet them at this abandoned like amusement park. And this is where everything really comes together towards the end. I didn't mention the hyena that she owned. That got her in some trouble as well. She bought a hyena from this guy and then fed the <laughs> fed the dude's remains to the hyena. It was kind of crazy. But anyway, Dinah and Zass are the first to meet Harley and Kane at that abandoned amusement park. And Dinah has every intention on freeing the kid. Dinah told Renee Montoya that that's where they were headed. But Zass realizes that like betrayal because he saw that on a text. And Huntress uh, ends up popping up, right? But Huntress, we get the backstory uh, she had her entire family killed, right? And Zass was actually one of the final goons that she had left that ended up being part of that clique that killed her, all of her family members. So all roles led to this amusement park and we have ourselves a bit of a Mexican standoff. Huntress kills Zass and because there are a bunch of goons outside of the amusement park, they realize that if they're gonna get out of this amusement park, Huntress, Harley, Dinah, Montoya, and Kane realize they gotta work together, right? Next is the sort of epic collective fight scene, right? And once they all run out of bullets, we see Black Canary finally do her classic scream, which Montoya already knew that she had that ability. This sends Harley Quinn and Hunters chasing Black Mask after this, who finally has uh, Cassandra Kane, right? So he finally got away with the kid and Harley is in pursuit. The ending scene, it's basically just Harley, Kane, and Black Mask at this dock, and Kane pulls the pin on a grenade, and then Black Mask is like kicked off of the dock, and he blows up midair, and all of his remains just like go in the water. It sounds kind of crazy, but that's what happened. And we end the entire movie with Huntress and Black Canary and Renee Montoya and Harley and Kane all in the restaurant eating and kicking it, right? Kane acts as if she's going to go to the bathroom to go crap out this diamond and she calls Harley for help, but they sneak out the back and take off stealing a Black Canary's car. So Harley's still the narrative tells us that Montoya, Dinah, and Huntress became vigilantes and they call themselves the Birds of Prey and that's really the movie. So Harley isn't necessarily in this Birds of Prey. So now that you know the overall plot, Let's do a little bit of comparing and contrasting when it comes to that historical information that I gave. As far as for my review, you'll enjoy this a lot if you go into the movie knowing, like, or more so not knowing anything about the characters. Normies would more than likely think it's okay, it's a fun film, and even though it has been promoted as if it's going to be this on the nose feminist lecture, it really wasn't. Though basically all the men though are seemingly incompetent for the most part, it's not as on the nose as they were presenting it. If you can get over the fact that Harley and the others seem like they overpower the guys, you can enjoy it. Though I completely understand if you can't. That's sort of the dynamic that you have to deal with when you're dealing with like these female characters without powers that are fighting in movies. It's not exclusive to them. When they're fighting other henchmen, generally they're depicted as, as stronger than they are and they overpower them. There's nothing that these characters do though in this movie that we don't already see other characters like Black Widow doing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In short, if you go into it removing that aspect of realism and know nothing about the characters, I think that you will find it decent. My lady who knows nothing about the characters or very little, she liked it and she had some fun watching it. The pacing is fine, right? And it does just enough to really introduce the backstory of the characters involved because Harley is narrating it. But through the lens of a comic book guy, I have my gripes and I guess we can talk about the positives first. Harley Quinn is a very believable Harley Quinn. She has been. The actress really embodies this character and I have to give her props on that. Another thing that I can credit is, I guess going into detail with the backstory of Huntress, which is very, very similar to what happened to her in the comics as far as having her entire family killed off only to come back and just go kill the mob members. The change they made to it was needless, however. Instead of having like her aunt or uncle take her back to Italy, which is where she trains, uh, this go around, it's like one of the actual killers who notice that she's still alive and has this soft heart. Not only does that not make any sort of sense, it was just totally unnecessary. Nonetheless, they at least touched on it and it is very similar to her 
origin in the comic books. I also like that Dinah Lance's mother, the original Black Canary, was mentioned as such in her conversation with Montoya. It also made for an epic scene when she finally used her powers as we all saw that coming. I guess she somewhat acts like what can be a Black Canary, but that's just giving her some leeway. And I guess I can give them props for acknowledging the recent retcon and her being the singer. The problem is she's not a punk rock singer or anything like that. She's just singing a version of It's a Man's World. This may be because, well, she's a tokenized version of Black Canary and maybe they think black people can't be in rock bands. Look, the movie isn't terrible even through the lens of a hardcore comic book guy, but it certainly is below average in that regards. It suffers the same thing that I see wrong with many other newer comic book depictions. They try too hard to modernize it, right? They also act as if it's a crime to stick to some of the historic source material. I consider it creative arrogance. I always have to say that I don't expect that the movies should be, or the, even the shows, to be exactly like the comics, right? But I'm not trying to hear that it's a different universe crap. There's zero point in using the characters if you don't have intention on honoring the legacy of them, right? If you want to do loose depictions, just create new characters. But don't call that movie The Birds of Prey. Don't use the characters if you plan to deviate so far from the source material that it's unrecognizable. I don't know the process of the writing, in these movies, but it seems as if the writers feel as if it's their duty to make changes to leave their own personal like imprint on the movie, right? Like it actually pains them to keep certain things intact. The thing is, you can still leave your imprint on a movie while not deviating that far from the source material. Good comic book writers do it all the time. They take characters that they did not personally create and tell new, fresh stories. So let's start with the most criminal part of this movie, Cassandra Kane. That ain't no damn Cassandra Kane. I don't know who that is. She's just a kid, a modernized kid that goes around and she's known as this thief. She's absolutely helpless the entire movie. And even when given the opportunity to show that she maybe could at least fight a little bit, there's no sign of that. No sign she's ever even thrown a punch in her life. This is criminal considering that She's a better fighter than all of the other characters in the story. Yes, Black Canary has gone toe to toe with her mother, Lady Shiva, but if there's one other character that can at least rival her in combat, it's just her, even as a kid. But at least Black Canary appears to be able to fight, it's just not ever explained why she can fight. Cassandra, on the other hand, can't fight at all. It's such a stupid change as they could have put any old girl if they wanted to have that same exact storyline. But to attach Kane's name to it was totally unnecessary. This means they went out of their way to jack this character up and I can't let them make it for that. Tokenized Black Canary is another thing that I knew you guys knew that I would be mentioning considering all the videos that I've done. I'm sure the racism essential to the character crowd will be out in full force in the comments, but I ain't really trying to hear that either. Because to accommodate this unnecessary race change, they even had this slight dialogue between her and Cassandra Kane, where Kane says she isn't the only one that steals from dumb white men or white people or something like that. When you think Black Canary, you think fair skin, blonde hair, either in a wig or dyed. Uh, but in this movie, she's black and she has these blondish sort of dreads. There's no classical fishnets either until she wears them on her arms at the end of the movie. Even considering the history being mentioned, that is only Black Canary really in name. Current studios can't resist these days and they gotta pull that diversity card, right? This is why they actually set out to cast Black Canary as black or biracial like she is, right? This wasn't some open casting where they just thought she was such a great actress that could really embody Black Canary. And I'm not saying that she's a bad actress. If they were so hell bent on using like a black character that's connected to the Birds of Prey, they could have used Vixen because she at least has an arc with them, though she never actually joins the team. It's funny because she looks way closer to Vixen on that cover that I showed you guys earlier than anything resembling Black Canary. That would have made more sense and would have been more preferable, though I still wouldn't have really tolerated it. The Birds of Prey consists of an all-white female team historically, and until everybody's obsession with diversity goes away, there's no way you're gonna get any version of that. Needless changes, you're gonna get. Her incredible fighting skills is one of the few things that they got right 
with the character. Huntress doesn't look or act like Huntress either. She's the butt of a lot of jokes considering that she's the crossbow hunter. The only thing captured great with her, again, is the fact that she can fight. Oh my God, the, the suit that she wears at the end of the movie when they're called the Birds of Prey is hideous. Both her and Black Canary have that going for them though, which leads me to my next point regarding Renee Montoya. They tried extremely hard, really too hard with this character and it was weird in casting considering like that depicted age and generational difference from the other characters, it doesn't mesh well at all. It doesn't make any sense and was yet another needless change that makes it far more corny. And I guess this is why I feel as if her addition is a complete joke, right? Her fighting in the film also isn't believable at all. Because she's being depicted as this original Birds of Prey member at the end of the film, her presence actually makes me mad. I like the idea of Huntress and Black Canary being depicted as original Birds of Prey members, even though Huntress wasn't an original member, but the context is why I can't tolerate Montoya being in the center of all this. There's absolutely no sign of Barbara Gordon, AKA at that time, Oracle. The fact that they had the nerve to call this movie Birds of Prey and leave her out as a founding member is totally uncalled for. But the fact that they tried to replace her with Montoya is just flat out criminal. This is like looking at like the creation of the Justice League and there's no sign of Batman or far worse, the Fantastic Four with no Reed Richards. It'd be one thing to act as if she was there as Oracle but then left the team, but that's not what this is. They set it up as if she had no part in its creation, which to me completely eliminates this film being taken seriously as a Birds of Prey movie. The Birds of Prey name was a bait and switch. It should have just been called Harley Quinn or a Harley Quinn film of some sort. Calling it Birds of Prey actually makes this movie worse for me. So through my lens, the movie severely drops the ball and wastes a good depiction of Harley Quinn. All of the good elements are completely negated by the bad elements, right? And it's sad because there was a lot of potential there. They simply tried too hard to modernize these characters. And Ewan McGregor, who I call Ewan McGregor, did not help this film on the promotional campaign when he's bragging about how this is such a feminist film, right? It actually isn't nearly as on the nose as he suggested that it would be, but I think that in itself turned a lot of people off from the film. And I guess that's why on opening night when I saw the movie, there were only two other people in that theater. I'm not making that up. DC, Warner Bros, or, or whoever has a bunch of incompetent tryhards that seem to be calling the shots for their films. They have a prime opportunity to pave their own way, making a more mature comic book universe that rivals the Marvel Cinematic Universe instead of just trying to follow in the footsteps or copy what the Marvel Cinematic Universe does really well. They have a great Harley Quinn, who most people seem to enjoy, and they completely botch it by being a bunch of tryhards attempting to appeal to this odd demographic. It's like they're sabotaging themselves, or they have maybe, I don't know, a bunch of Marvel plants that are posing as writers and producers, but have bad intentions. I'm positive a bunch of nerds at the comic book shop could have written a better movie centered around the Birds of Prey that not only appeased comic book fans, longtime comic book fans, but also appealed to the normies. You had to go out of your way to screw this up, and that's exactly what they did. And this isn't even any disrespect to the actors or the actresses involved. They were just set up for failure. So if you're a complete normie that wants just a fun film, I could see where you can get some decent enjoyment from it. It can be some mindless entertainment if you can get over the fact that these chicks hit like they have superpowers, yet they don't have any super strength. But if you are familiar with the Birds of Prey, you're going to make yourself really mad and frustrated watching this movie. Between Cassandra Cain being nerfed to the oblivion and she's totally unrecognizable and the crew calling themselves the Birds of Prey but they look goofy and they also have no Barbara Gordon, it's not really worth it. Unless you just want to see a decent Harley Quinn depiction, I'd pass on this and save yourself the frustration. But I'm done here. Man, this video took a lot longer than anticipated, uh, but it was a little fun to make. If you're new and you want more videos like this, please consider becoming an actual member to the channel. We have a lot of good chats. We do a lot of live streams and I get material out every single day. But that's gonna do it, man. Until next time, y'all be easy.